distinguished uh, artist in Vancouver where she lives and she has shown across Canada and internationally. Alison received her BFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design and her MFA from the University of British Columbia. Her work uh, resides in several collections including the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Vancouver Art Gallery, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, the BAMP Center, and the Art Gallery of Windsor. She has uh, numerous awards, including senior artist grants from the Canada Council, the Mexico-Canada-USA Artist Exchange Residency, and the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Residency Program. She is a professor in the School for Contemporary Arts at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver and is represented in Toronto by Katzman Contemporary Art. Where she had an opening uh, this past winter uh, <laughs> of some really wonderful text and design paintings that reflect in various ways on the uh, position of abstract painting in Canada. And at that opening, uh, in order to get there, you had to go through a blizzard. So it was a, a very interesting experience moving from the white uh, world into the more chromatic world that Alison presented. So please join me in welcoming Alison Clay. Thank you very much, John, for nicely pronounced introduction. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for hosting me here. And um, nice to see an audience. So um, I thought I would talk about, um, as John said, uh, we have a friend in common called Lucy Hogg, who um, she used to live in Vancouver and now lives in New York. And um, she said she was wishing she was here because I have some explaining to do, she said. And the explanation is why I'm currently making paintings with text. When I spent quite a few years before that using photography in my work, making video and installations, and um, moving slowly back towards painting through a collage, collaging steel works together. Maybe that's enough of an explanation for Lucy, but I will go into detail here. Um, I'm not sure if I can explain why, but um, <clears throat> partly I think that for me, my practice in photography became to be too distracted from my manual experience making work and I really um, felt like I'd like to have that time in the studio again. Um, <clears throat> instead of just doing all my art by phone and um, email. And um, also because I began to uh, enjoy the idea of text in art more and I wanted to find a medium um, that I could use that would uh, be interesting an interesting, um, have an interesting relationship to actual words and, and letters. And I think painting, because it's kind of contrary to uh, text, works well for me. Anyway, um, so uh, this uh, talk I'm calling Liquid Spatial Evocations, and um, it's actually a quote from Roald Nasgaard's book on uh, Canadian abstract painting. And he, and this, uh, phrase is from his description of one of Millie Ristvet's paintings um, called After Rameau's Nephew from 1978. Oops. Uh, and I'll come back to why I'm interested in Roald Nasgaard and that kind of phrase. Um, and I thought I would start with uh, just a, uh, a recent uh, text work which is a digital print that I did in honor of um, Jeannie Thibb, who is an artist who passed away this year, uh, actually last year. And um, it was based, uh, we were asked to make a work based on one of her uh, drawings, uh, patterns. She works with patterns. So this is 
the pattern here. Um, and uh, I like to uh, work within a, a frame, uh, tight frame, because of I'm still uh, suffering from conceptual training uh, hangover from NASCAD years. So um, this is leaf leafing, cut cutting, fret fretting, trace tracing, fold over fall, sun falls, lace furls, blossom barrier, lit ornament, shift shifting, leaves leaving. So that was for Jeannie, and uh, it's a very small print, eight by eight inches. Um, and then I'm going back to very early work from 1988 um, when I first began, began to be interested in text. Um, this was a show that I did at Artspeak Gallery in Vancouver, which um, was formed by a bunch of artists that came down from a university in the interior which was closed down by the right-wing government because there are too many lefties in that town. And a lot of uh, uh, artists and writers came down and uh, started Artspeak Gallery in Vancouver. So what these are on the left-hand side are four uh, paintings that are one foot square each. You'll recognize the tight form of the uh, square. And um, on each of these, I made a painting by mixing my own paint and using what I thought were kind of abstraction tropes. And um, <clears throat> And then uh, across the, the room from these paintings were uh, four descriptions, also closed in uh, as close as possible to rec uh, rectangles or squares, which describe the art making process. And um, at that time I was reading, actually it, it explained to you how to make one of these. So the idea was is that this is for you to make. This is an example of what you can make, and these are the instructions. So this is a recipe. However, the recipe was interrupted by uh, subjective musings. So uh, you couldn't just do the straight recipe without hearing my voice in your ear. Um, and uh, it was accompanied by a little um, art book, and the show was called Lure. So, uh, and so the uh, book actually presented the text uh, against um, the, each text. So the instructions were the same more or less, except there were different images, and, uh, but I still varied the kinds of instructions, like what kind of wood to use and uh, how to mix your paint, et cetera. Um, and then each, uh, each um, subjective text had a different kind of um, interference with another narrative and um, this one because it was a, it had something to do with the image so this yeah, I've got that little thing here so because it was a strip across I just did a break um, I did this strip of text um, which kind of described uh, a political Irish event um, someone whose son was murdered uh, in the strife, the troubles, as they called it. Anyways, um, it's too much to describe <clears throat> for these works. The next series I did were uh, paintings of labyrinths, so I kind of expanded into um, uh, exploring abstraction more. These are two feet by two feet square, and um, it's oil on linen, and um, there's also an accompanying text for this. Um, and I also was still strongly rooted to my conceptual foundations, and um, I didn't choose the colors um, in a subjective way. I actually took a design book and picked two colors that were put together in this design book and then went to the um, art supply store and bought the paint that was closest to those colors and just made a made the painting and I made the painting with not without tape so I had to turn it around because it's easier to paint straight lines by painting up into them so I did a line and a line and a line it was wet into wet um, so it has a nice kind of uh, tremor to it while still being very formal and I also saw the labyrinth image as being narrative image because your eye can take you around the painting to the center and back if you want to spend that time doing that. 
Um, <clears throat> and uh, the book that accompanied this, it was called The Stories, and uh, each um, abstract pattern, so I made 10 of these, had a story accompanying it. And the story was about walking in the city. So I took the idea of labyrinth um, as a kind of uh, uh, icon or trope of the city's map, and, um, and I wrote stories about, small stories, very, very short stories about um, wandering in the city. And um, I'm actually in the process of putting these to music. I'm um, going to be working with a person who plays accordion, and we're going to make songs out of them. Are you going to sing? Uh, <laughs> I think that would be a little problematic. <clears throat> I don't know what's going to, maybe she'll sing. That'll take the burden off. Um, then I went on to further uh, paintings where, in fact, instead of just using the guideline for color and, and actually painting it myself, I hired people to make my paintings, to paint them. And, um, but I did, uh, choose, and I wrote the text myself. So I wrote, and they're, again, they're very small stories. Um, and this left-hand panel here, I, all the, I sent um, 20 panels to a company that does false surfaces for um, wealthy people's houses. Um, so this is a copper sur surface. Where did my thing go? Yeah. And, um, and the person I hired to paint this was recently graduated from Emily Carr and needed a job. And I thought he was a pretty good painter. So I said, OK, I'd like a night sky. And I'd like a storm. And I'd like this and I'd like that. So he just went along and I accepted them. I did paint a few of them myself, so just because I thought I should. This is not one I painted myself. And these are all stories about women um, in the city. So I was beginning to be more interested in gender and the city and how the, um, the subject in the city who was the peripatetic <laughs> perambulator person um, was always a man. And uh, so I thought, okay, I'm going to see, what, I'm going to write stories that suggest a, a woman in the city or a woman taking action, making things, and, um, and just turn it around a little bit. The female flaneur I was interested in. The flaneur being this romantic uh, idea of a, of a guy who, slightly separate from society, but walks around among and uh, observes and writes about what society is. The outsider. So I'm also outsiding, outsiding by being the female flaneur. And I made um, two series of paintings. This is um, <clears throat> um, this is one. And then I made this next series of 10 works. And um, these were done with photographs on canvas. And then the right-hand panel, I, did my, I painted myself of skies. And um, the process for the text is screen print. So um, these were screen printed on also. And um, so I would work with the screen printer um, situating the text on the, on the painting. And um, I wrote the text, et cetera. So this is the dreams I'm having affect my speech. And then a kind of separate. The novels she was reading began to affect her daily routines. She walked with determination and took unfamiliar routes. Her appearance and her voice changed. She was promoted at work. I was going through tenure at this time, tenure reviews. Um, and then around this time also, I was experimenting with other media printmaking. And um, so this again was the screen print that I did on the dollar bills that were going out of service at the time. So I bought a bunch of dollar bills and I made a series of works um, on them. So on one side it says blemish and on the other side it says abrasion. Abrasion. Thank you. <laughs> um, so just um, a little side uh, story. Um, my interest in text was also an interest in theory and literature and books. 
Um, I was interested in how books, in fact, are physical objects, not just theory. And um, books are beautiful to hold, and um, you know, paper is good to feel. And um, and when you're an academic, sometimes you get too many books, and you feel the heaviness of theory, and you want to let it go. So I wanted a kind of an urban event where I, this was the building I was living in, but um, I doubled the photographs so that the building, which is a very urban, uh, modernist building, goes on forever and there's me there a couple of times, so I have some kind of companionship in this activity. <laughs> um, and I threw out books and uh, so obviously this is photoshopped because uh, you wouldn't be able to I had to do a lot of photos to catch different books in different forms, so um, they are photographed, but not uh, all in the same photograph. So I added a few books. And this was from a commission that I did for Presentation House Gallery in, uh, in North Vancouver. And it was uh, a long painting like this because it was meant to be the same size as you put on the side of a bus as an adver advertisement. Um, and it was also the same size as the ads in the uh, bus station, so um, it was an ad. Now, unfortunately, this um, went up in um, September 11th, uh, and uh, what year was that? 2001? Yeah. <laughs> and um, there was a person that was really upset by it, but just one person, because this reminded them of um, bailing from the two tow the twin tower, so that was an unfortunate coincidence and a sort of silly anecdote. Um, and then I went on to make a large photographic works about flying books. Again, just uh, enjoying the beauty of them. Um, so I had my husband who was really good at baseball when he was a kid. He chucked books and I photographed them. Um, and these are uh, not, they're only photograph. they're only photoshopped because I had to take out some shadowing from capturing a slight movement in the air. But otherwise they are against the sky they were in. Um, and I wanted them to look more stationary and frozen. So these I showed at uh, uh, Leo Kamen Gallery uh, about 2005 or 2006. Okay, air to water. Um, I thought, okay, I want to look at books uh, that are being destroyed underwater, and um, I liked uh, looking at them. Um, they're beautiful shapes. So I actually took books that um, had some significance for me, my own catalogs, um, uh, a book by an Italian critic call, uh, who's called Achille Bonito Oliva, and he wrote about this art movement called Transavanguardia, um, Trans Avantgarde, <clears throat> and um, uh, just books that had some kind of significance, and I destroyed them. This particular book um, is called the, the Pornographer's Poem. And it's by Michael Turner, I don't know, he's a writer in Vancouver. Um, <clears throat> and I, I won this actually at a, at a fundraising event at the Artspeak Gallery, and he signed it for me. Um, but he did spell my name wrong. Oh. Anyway, um, so uh, after that was drowned, I thought, what am I going to do with this book? I dried all the books and I still have many of them just kind of bundled up and curled up and dried so you can still read them. I think one of these books was also an October magazine, uh, different theory and um, art writing. So I thought I would just do, um, restage them as a kind of an event, post-event flurry in a space which is also in that building that I was throwing books out of. So um, this is the pornographer's poem, um, a critique, perhaps. 
Unfortunately for this artwork, I cannot find the original uh, film so to date. Um, so I have a, a photocopy scanned um, image of the um, of the centerfold of a of a, a catalog of my work, and uh, so it's a little hard to see because the line down the middle is distracting. But um, <clears throat> this is going back to my interest in the city and activities in the city, and expanding my interest in. Um, being a, a female flaneur and uh, flaneuse, and um, being a, voy a voyeuse, I guess, um, if there is such a term. And um, so I made these videos from my rooftop in Vancouver, looking into other people's windows. But I made them into little tiny projections, again, um, thinking about book size and storytelling size, um, and made these stands and, where's my little thing, there it is, okay. So there's a small projector and glass, and then a stand, and then there's these, uh, you probably maybe don't even remember these things, but these are VCRs. Um, so there were five of these, and each one was running a loop of uh, an image that I had taped uh, from looking in windows from my rooftop. And um, so this is an example of one of the loops, um, or one of the images, it's um, still. Every so often in the audio, uh, the audio I remixed to mix more street uh, sounds, and every so often you would hear a gasp. <gasps> and then, then maybe later you might hear, nothing ever happens. So that was the audio for these works. Um, I can tell you about things that I was reading at the time, but maybe, you know, it, I was reading Michel de Certeau's The Practice of Everyday Life, was a big influence on me, and probably still continues to this day. <laughs> um, these hang around in my brain for many years. Um, and yeah, and so this was actually an empty apartment, and the and I was looking, I my, had my camera trained on it and nothing was happening and suddenly this guy popped up and uh, he was a painter, I guess. He was wearing painting overalls and he went and took a swig of a drink and then he went back and disappeared again. So I did get one person. This is actually another building where, interestingly, there's a person here and there's a person here and they're both cooking in the kitchen. So. What these also reminded me of, in particular this image here, are paintings, um, like Vermeer paintings or Dutch paintings of interiors. They're about light. Of course, they don't have the detail, but um, the kind of light and the kind of mundane activity was interesting to me. So that's the video. Um, OK, photography and photography and painting. Um, Way back in 1999, 1995, I um, was in the U.S. and uh, on this Mexico, Mexico, Canada uh, exchange, and I was at Irvine University. Um, and in, if you ever live down there for a little while, you'll know that people drive around a lot. So everybody who taught at UC California, Irvine, lived in Los Angeles. And they might also teach, if you're a sessional, you might also teach somewhere like at Cal Arts, which is like way north, and you drive way south. So you do a lot of freeway driving. And I did too, because I always wanted, I was staying in Irvine, but I always wanted to go into LA to see shows and things. Anyway, um, so I, you know, I was kind of, for many years, I was thinking about how can I do a work that's about driving that might interest me? And um, in the meantime, while I was there, I rented a little airplane, and um, we went and flew around over at Los Angeles and um, the environment around Irvine. And I took photographs. <clears throat> so um, somehow it just came to me, like in 2008, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And uh, these were um, based on the f this one photograph I took of a mall. Um, near Irvine, which is actually a circular mall, 
and um, so you can enter from anywhere and there's all the you know the, the shops big box stores and stuff in their movie theaters and stuff but when photographed from the air of course you get perspective and the circle is not a circle it's an ellipse and um, another thing I did with this image that I really liked was I didn't get the whole mall in in one shot so I thought I don't care I'm going to finish them all off by using the end of one of one end and uh, reversing it upside down and sticking it onto the other end. So the, the photograph is actually um, altered also. And I kind of altered it some more. There was one building that had a swimming pool on the top, on the roof, and so I kind of multiplied that a few times. And so if you do end up looking at the photo, uh, while you're looking at the piece, you will see these quirky things. So these are steel um, ellipses, and um, so the photographs are uh, mounted on these. And then these other ellipses I painted by spray painting car paint on them. I made uh, an addition, two editions actually. This one is the black and white edition, so it's kind of the Silver City edition. So it has colors that are you know, car colors, silver color, black, kind of maybe brownish, gray, things like that. So this was the Silver City one. After that, I thought, I want to paint more, but I don't want to paint with car paint because I nearly killed my assistant and I didn't want his mother to find out that what kind of work he was doing for me, even though he doesn't didn't care. Um, so I thought, well, I'm going to paint, but where do I paint? Like, what do I do? And I thought, I'm going to go back to those labyrinths and test them out, and make them 3D. So I did that. And I made a bunch of paintings that nobody's really ever going to see except when I do talks. <laughs> they're oil on linen. They're about three feet. And um, I kind of use this axiometric perspective to bump up the... Um, the labyrinth, so there was another spatial uh, element there. Um, and also the, they were um, dysfunctional labyrinths, so this is probably maybe one of the more functional ones, but um, sometimes I chopped off the edges and uh, made them really ambiguous in terms of the, the suggested real space. Then I made um, these works, which were shown at Leo Cayman, and they're tiny works, they're collages, and again, you can see the relationship between these works and the, um, the ellipse, the exploded ellipse. Um, these were photographs that I took um, in 1997, and I was playing, I had a stereo camera, and my brother gave it to me to use while I was in Paris um, at the artist residency there. And um, so I went around with this camera not exactly knowing what I wanted to do and found myself at the uh, new library. Um, it's the National Library there. And um, it had a really interesting, has really interesting modernist architecture where it has these towers um, that are meant to look, remind you of books. At each end and then um, in the middle there's a large wooden plaza um, so I looked at these and I thought aha books so I use these um, as the basis to make these um, again thinking about uh, the 3d-ness of the of the labyrinth I kind of use the stereo image to make a puzzling photographic image um, so th this is, again, these are metal, and they actually hang on the wall with um, magnets. I'll go fast. <laughs> I should hand out free coffees for my talks. <clears throat> um, so, here's another one. And uh, yeah, so they're collaged. So there's one form that's this shape, and then there's an um, aluminum form glued on, and then um, these forms are glued on each separately, and um, 
painted separately. So um, it's a it's a physical um, collage in steel. And um, I don't know, you know, I really don't know how readable these images are if you don't know what they are. But the one thing is there's two book images happening here. This looks like the center fold of two pages being open. And then these are repeating kind of book images here that are a modernist version of the book. And this suggests another kind of architecture. The subjectivity that I was interested in earlier, where I was interested in inserting my voice or talking about the female flaneur, the flaneuse, um, is, I thought, replaced or put back in with the brushstroke of the painting. So I was happy with that being the physical presence. Now, that's quite ambiguous because if you are interested in gender and painting, it's really a masculine gesture uh, historically, um, but I realized that it's not going to become a feminine gesture of empowerment unless women keep painting. So there you go. <clears throat> then um, I thought, well, to hell with imagery at all, and um, I'm going to make these shaped steel paintings um, that are monochromes and that still have some relationship to the idea of the city. So boundaries was interesting to me. Um, and these are probably, this one's about three feet, roughly three feet around. And again, um, they hung on the wall with magnets. Uh, this is a smaller one. And um, I did some in wood, I made wood um, small studies too. So this one, actually I named them after suburban kinds of things. So this is called Crazy About the New Spring Fashions. This is called Shade Parking. This is called Golf on Rode Rodeo Drive. OK, jumping back to a new moment, or forward to a new moment. I was also, I've, I read a lot, and um, I uh, like to think about feminine subjectivity um, in many different ways, other than just painting and photography. And I was interested in trying to do a video about this notion of talking to oneself in one's head. So I don't know how many of you have these conversations with yourself on different levels. Some are quite overt. For instance, if you, like uh, my friend Michelle Gay, who's working on the computer at home while I'm staying with her as her host, she's my host, she talks to herself all the time on the computer, and I think she's talking to me, but she's not. She has big problems and she has to voice them out loud. But that's kind of like inner thinking. But then there's inner inner thinking where it's not so articulate. You're kind of in conversation with yourself almost um, unconsciously. It so happened that a friend of mine, Lisa Robertson, a poet who now lives in France, um, was also thinking about the same thing. And um, we decided we would collaborate on a work. And we invited. Um, um, Natalie Stevens, also known as Nathaniel, um, to join us and um, be the poet and the listener. Um, and we made this video. Um, so uh, Lisa wrote a script for this, and um, I retreated. I was going to write something, actually, for a couple of years I was trying to write this, and I was too bored with my own writing. Um, and I thought, Ish, maybe I'll ask somebody who's a good writer to do it, and that was Lisa. Um, so um, maybe I'll just read from my notes here. Uh, I've been interested in urbanism, feminist subjectivity, the everyday, rupture, abstract form, poetry, um, and inner thought. So it is the inner thought which produces the exterior voices in my earlier work. So when I inserted subjective text, those are inner thoughts. They're not kind of asking you for a response. Um, inner thought needs a critical look, as Carol Becker says in her essay on micro-utopias. 
Um, now many artists fear that the world has become too interior focused and that private space and identity are all there is, even in the public arena. Most significantly, those personal issues are rarely linked to the greater social context that could help frame them, isolate their origins, and catalyze their resolutions. <clears throat> um, so I wanted to relook at thought, the activity of the thinking that goes on while thinking or doing something else in a critical way. So I worked in collaboration with two poets, Lisa Robertson, which is here, she's there, and Nathaniel Stevens, here. Um, I played the shadow character, I kind of turn up in the mirror, this mirror every now and then. Um, and we did it as part of a media residency at the Western Front in Vancouver. So here's an, another still. I hired a photographer too, and the photographer just traipsed around the whole time during the video, and you could hear the click of the camera and the feet going, and then he'd pop in every now and then to get a closer shot. Um, so he was kind of another, you know, a, a, a Brechtian kind of moment, or uh, part of the video. Um, and in the back I projected this film uh, which Lisa introduced me to, um, this uh, French filmmaker called Jean-Claude Rousseau. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, John. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful filmmaker. He makes beautiful, 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 achingly beautiful films. And um, so this is uh, from a film, Jeune Femme à sa fenêtre, Lise une lettre, which, excuse my pronunciation. Um, so it's based on the idea of a Vermeer painting, but um, the camera is just so gorgeously, the camera more listens than watches, and um, it moves around and listens to the interiors and the exterior, the window, etc. It was made in, um, in the early, mid-80s. Um, in my mind, this video uh, was about painting and how inner thought is like a cog that moves the paint. Carol Becker also says, art is often a kind of dreaming the world into being, a transmutation of thought into material reality, and an affirmation that the physical world begins in the incorporeal, in ideas, incorporeal. <clears throat> so this is the um, this is the text, uh, another text um, that uh, Lisa wrote in relation to this, and it's called the setting. I'm just showing you a scan of um, the, the uh, where it was printed in the catalog, and uh, it's written interestingly where she's looking at different paintings in the national um, in in uh, what would it be called, the National Gallery in, in London. And, um, and she was looking at how the, the, the um, descriptions of the paintings, the title cards, and she was copying them. And so basically her poem is almost a direct um, copying out of those description cards. And it becomes like an assemblage of beautiful images um, that are all about um, 17th century paintings. Uh, about society. So um, uh, I was very influenced by that. Um, I won't read it out. You can maybe just glance at it for a bit. It's just too much reading. But oh, this painting, this painting explores different degrees of fear. And those things are, you know, very um, evocative. And, um, yeah, so uh, because I teach painting, and I don't teach painting a lot in my SFU program, we have a very uh, condensed program and we have one painting class that somebody can take twice. So basically you come out of our uh, undergraduate program with the ability to do everything and almost nothing. Um, <clears throat> But really smart people, and we have people going to, are just graduating from NYU, 
um, and people graduating from um, Oslo Art School and um, Pizza of Art. So it's not like we don't educate them, it's just they don't get like a good technology education. They get grounded in everything. Anyway, so for this painting class, I thought, okay, I'm just going to hand out, I'm going to write descriptions of paintings and just hand them out. This was my abstract painting section. And um, so I wrote descriptions of various abstract paintings. And I got a lot of um, the images I was writing about from Roald Nasgaard's book on abstract painting in Canada. So I chose those paintings that seemed like they'd be easy to write about um, so that you could imagine what I was you know, the work from me writing about it, and you could make a work. I forgot that, you know, why could I forget this how? That students are so smart that they can actually find some of these things online, even though it seems anonymous. So, oops, checking for updates. Um, <laughs> working in the background. But um, anyway, not too many people did that, but some did, unfortunately. Um, so I kind, of, I kind of thought of it as a kind of Cole's Notes version of how to learn abstract painting. Um, I wrote 20 descriptions, handed them out, and got a bunch of paintings made. And unfortunately, I don't have images of them. I didn't get permission from my students, so I won't be able to show you them yet. But um, this particular description is of Elizabeth Mackintosh painting. So um, I got a very strange interpretation of this. And it was a, made an interesting painting. So you get interesting renditions of other people's paintings. Um, so while I was reading about these paintings, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't help looking, reading as well as looking at them in this book. I, I, I realized I was very attracted to how abstraction was written about, and um, Roald Nasgard has written a very um, useful book uh, going over historically and also regionally in terms of abstract painting. And, um, and he, he loves painting, so he's really into making these sensuous descriptions of trying to evoke what it feels like to stand in front of one of these paintings and look at it. So um, here's an example of his writing, deep eruptive textures were created by dragging saw blades across the surface. Paint was pulled into ridges and smudged into crevices. Anybody? Who is that Ewan? Does anybody know? He's like an Ontario guy. Come on. <laughs> Patterson Ewan. Okay. Um, here's another page and my underlining. So you can see I've been influenced a lot by thinking along with Lisa Robertson about, you know, what how painting is written about. And she was interested in society high society paintings from the 17th century, and I was, you know, suddenly interested in abstract painting. <clears throat> um, the painting we see part of on the left is by Douglas Haynes and called Bonzo's Last Stand, 1978. The text that I've scribbled is on is actually by Harold Feist. Um, so, uh, shapes flutter and dance. I don't know, I think it's great writing, it's very poetic. I also wanted to kind of get you, um, to let you know that all throughout my uh, adult, even young adult life, I've been interested in um, poetry and um, was very influenced early on by this poet called Carmina Archiloki, or Archiloki, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce that the fragments of Archilokos. And they're fragments have survived, they're surviving fragments of Greek poetry. And um, so you get these text and shape things that um, you get text, you kind of get an idea boiled down to just fragments that were there before. Um, he's the earliest known Greek author to compose almost entirely on the theme of his own emotions and experiences. So again, it, 
I didn't know this when I was, you know, 16 years old, but it makes sense now, reading that, that it's influenced me all my life. He lived around 480 BC. One author calls his remaining poems table scraps, which actually was the name I wanted to give to my cat, but I wasn't allowed to by my husband. So here's a, you know, a scan of one of the of two pages of the book, and you can see these very evocative things happening. In copulating, one discovers that. Um, and somehow they become really meaningful. I knocked him out the door with a vine stump cudgel. And uh, to put them in perspective, I also, being a student at NASCAD, was very influenced by the work of Lawrence Wiener, who's, a, who's an artist. Have you guys learned about him in any of your classes? Um, he's an artist that uh, paints mostly on the wall. Um, he doesn't paint. It's actually stenciled, or now it's actually um, uh, linotype, etc. But his artworks are statements and words. Um, and I have a deeper understanding of modernist sculpture because of him, amazingly. Um, he came and did a talk at Emily Carl many years ago, and uh, I was pretty young then, also. Not a, I was a graduate student at the time. And he said that modernist sculpture is about moving one thing from one place to another place. And I've thought about that for many years, and the more I've seen a modernist sculpture, the, thing I, the more I understand about art in the 20th century, and the language that, the kind of paradigm that I'm still living in, within. So um, this is an interesting example of um, his work written on a brick wall. One quart exterior green industrial enamel thrown on a brick wall. So that's an example of one of his statements. And they're almost like instructions for works. So you can do it yourself. And that, I guess, had influenced me in terms of making those square paintings with instructions that went along with them. Um, so I, it, it just, I'm also, I've, over time I've been interested in the tone of language of the everyday, the cryptic bits of text that one picks up, walking past people in conversation, shortcuts in saying things, and the droll. Um, prosaic being ordinary or unimaginative, the dull, the mundane. This uh, photograph is uh, um, by Richard Landry. Um, and it's a text from an artist book uh, on Lawrence Wiener that I happen to have in my collection. Another influence uh, was um, this book. And actually, it wasn't the book. It was I went to a reading by Auden, the poet, W.H. Auden, in 1971 in Manchester, England, uh, where I started university at University of Manchester. He came and did a reading, and um, I was extremely influenced by this these short poems, and it's uh, it's from a they were from a book that was recently published or about to be published um, called Academic Graffiti, and um, I memorized this poem, and that's about the only thing I've memorized in my life that has stayed with me, even though we had to memorize a sonnet by Shakespeare every week in high school. I only know this poem. Um, so John Milton never stayed in a Hilton hotel, oops, which is just as well. And um, <laughs> there's another subtext to why I like this. Uh, just a quick subtext, when I was in high school I went to Rome, I lived in Rome, and one of the classes I took was on city planning, in the history of city planning in Rome. And we w would have to t walk around Rome and, and uh, look at a 17th century map and do some explorations and write some papers on um, some buildings or um, avenues. And uh, there was always uh, like six to 
fifth um, tore up part of Rome to make pil pilgrimage routes and um, in the 17th century, late 17th century. And always at the end of every street where it, where it landed at the church you were supposed to go to, there was an obelisk so that you knew. It was kind of like a compass handle. This is, you're going in the right direction. So um, there was one street in Rome, though, that you, it was actually built before that in the Renaissance. And if you stood at one end and looked at the other end, you could see up on the hill, on the other side of Rome, you could see the Hilton Hotel. And I like that. There was no obelisk. Here's another one. Um, God, good Queen Victoria, in a fit of euphoria, commanded Disraeli to blow up the old Bailey. My other influence um, is Christopher Wool. This work I have a poster of that hangs up at home. I read it every day. It still takes me a while to figure out what the next word is going to be. Um, I like that it slows down reading, and I think it is a sad piece in a way. Um, it reads, the show is over. The audience gets up to leave, to leave their seats. Time. Mm. To collect. Time to collect their coats <laughs> and go home. They turn around, no more coats, and no more home. I think it's just a beautiful, beautiful piece. So um, it's enamel paint on aluminum, and you can, this one exhibition I was in in Europe, I picked it up, and I'm glad I have this. It, they were takeaway, really big poster. Also, things that I find um, are interesting to me. This is a little um, list that I picked up off the street near me. Floral dress, hunter boots, chartreuse scarf, aqua cardigan, gray heart cardigan. I think this is color. This is somebody, I don't know if this is what somebody wants to wear one day or what, but it's short, poetic, and everyday. So then I, um, this kind of influenced this painting called uh, Slap Chartreuse, um, and it reads, uh, tinged with crimson, crazy eye popping, viscous orange flux. So some words that I find uh, lying around um, Chartreuse uh, turn up again in other works. I also want to say that some of my uh, influences um, are come from students, and um, these are two works by a graduate student that I had um, called Anna Marie um, Repstock, and she had an undergraduate degree in English and was doing this graduate work English, and then undergraduate, she had two undergraduate degrees, one in a BFA in painting, and then she came to study with me because somebody told her I worked with text. Um, and these are two paintings that she made. Um, and our, she was, she's a very, very bright person. And we have amazing discussions about um, poetry, um, text, and um, painting. Um, so she has a very strange style. It's very eccentric. Um, and, but I choose to support it, even though I don't know where it fits in, in painting land. But, um, this is, uh, these are kind of channels that she makes, and then the paint kind of builds up on, on the sides of the channels, and it is kind of like a, it's like a, a picture of what paint does when you just make a stroke and you don't care about the edges. So she was working with that idea and, and enhancing it. So this says, um, oh, and the other one says sundown. And these are um, some images to kind of give you a sense of the show that I did at Katzman Cayman Gallery in February. And I think people who came to the opening should all be given medals because the weather, <laughs> I've never been in such weather. Um, yes, it was snowing heavily all day and then it switched to rain and then yeah, there was thunder and lightning. It was delightful weather in Toronto. 
So these paintings, um, again, um, so what they're doing is I'm taking these sections out of the Roald Dasgard work and I've um, reshaped, I've remade, I've made them into my, I've made my own uh, word compositions and stuffed them into difficult shapes as part of a canvas space. So um, you can see I have all sorts. We'll look at those. Um, and probably this one was the first one. What a furore, I don't know how to pronounce that word. What a furore, what passion in these irregular lines. Um, and this one is ice slick green slapped over and over magenta so flat. I wanted to use really heightened color um, uh, because I'm not so good with being subtle with color, but I'm, as you can see, I'm trying to teach myself that later on. Recently, I've been trying to do that. Um, and I really thought the brush stroke was really important, so I kind of heightened that. And uh, I had a big conundrum about text, whether I should uh, do vinyl, design vinyl text, so it looked kind of corporate, or whether I should use hand-done text, and is hand-done text too hokey? Anyway, I went with the handwritten text. It's hokey. But it has passion. <laughs> um, then I, yeah, so I started um, s switching up whether it should be straight up and down or not. Um, this is ochre, chrome ochre, ultramarine, all patchy. This one we already read. Um, I wanted to, you know, you know, when you write text, you kind of want to maybe make it readable on the canvas. So I wanted to play around with the fact that it's going to make it hard to read because this is painting. I can do, you know, I can make painting make the text. So I was kind of interested in that. Um, black, black, indigo, dot, 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 maybe. So you can see that my interest in these kind of shapes, the containment, senses of containment that I get from thinking about city, thinking about city blocks um, and roots um, um, and place, I'm using as uh, abstract forms inside uh, an abstract painting. So they reference abstract painting. So blue there in oxblood, sweep and flow. Another installation view. There were uh, two, sm four small paintings, and I have to say, Marianne, I'm sorry to say this, but I didn't really like this installation of these two works together, but it was something that she liked, and we kind of left it like that. Um, so, as lead white cut here and there, fast with azure, or how we pronounce that, I don't know. Um, slam down squill blue mustard mustard violet um, drip ripped ground splat pink and broad wide lavender and not chaos just daub daub void daub void daub lumpy and true this is kind of a comment on me painting these paintings are about four by five feet and this one um, is kind of uh, abbreviated, cut off before it finishes. And space, a line of color, a slip slipping of dragged over, dragged O. Anyway, so I kept, uh, these are recent works, just a couple of them to show you um, what's happening in, in my recent work that I'm trying to do a couple of different things with painting and um, really thinking about uh, following the paint um, and seeing what the paint does with the text as a more letting that take precedence and discovering that way. Um, and I'm working now in a, as a kind of a painter painter. It's not, I'm not sure what's going to come out of each painting. This is what came out of this painting. Oh yeah, I should also say that um, I wanted to make a series of paintings about Sigmar Polka. 
And I liked the idea of making paintings about him because he's kind of the ultimate painter, the magician. People refer to him as the magician. Um, and uh, what's it uh, called when you make gold out of base metals? Um, alchemy. He's an alchemist. And so he's kind of the iconic painter because all painters are alchemists, scientists, but scientists of magic. Um, so I did a lot of reading, and, um, and then I did a lot of writing, and, um, but not much writing came out of it, and I didn't, there was just too much writing to make an interesting painting, so I kind of cut back. And somehow this word came out of that first painting was this. Um, and you can see that I have some overpainted text, like, and, and these were, a this is a list of, of items in his work. So gun, bullet, flower, ghost, cloud, and irritable. I don't know who's irritable, me or him, but uh, he's no longer alive, but recent, recent uh, contemporary painter, recently contemporary. This is another one, and I've been experimenting with uh, layers of text, so, I'm uh, sorry, layers of paint, um, so that you can see through it a little bit. Uh, this emerged out of a whole bunch of other text, and um, down here there was spittle, and I didn't like that, so, but it sort of is there still. And bile is another word that comes up, somehow emerged, came out of reading uh, Sigmar Polka. So it came from one of the texts. It's a quote. It's a word that came out of the actual text that somebody was writing about him. And another one, um, dub. So again, um, there's a whole other phrase set of a whole other sentence underneath that um, got broken up and um, exists as a kind of ghost underneath. So these are the three most recent works that I have. And that's it. Oh. And that's a painting by Peter Doig, I know now. <laughs> is that a whole painting or is that a crop, is that a, a detail? detail? Yeah, I thought so. So, does anybody have any questions? Uh, you introduced yourself as a recovering conceptualist. Yeah. Of, uh, Nova Scotia School of Art and Design. Uh, but your work is also really concerned with beauty, it looks like. Right? Yeah. Is a big yeah. Is that a conflict within you, or is that something you've always kind of uh, embraced? Or do you think you would have been an abstract expressionist had you not gone to Nazca? Possibly latter. Um, I, I found um, no trouble uh, understanding beauty in conceptual art, though. It just wasn't particularly about paint. So, for instance, the, the, um, uh, the wall works by um, Lawrence Wiener were beautiful to me. Um, and um, so I never found any trouble with that. But it was a split between making paintings and figuring out how to tie that back into my interest in conceptual, my respect for it, I guess, and my love of it. Um, really, I would have loved to have had a conceptual painter teach me. But in, when I was at NASCAD, the painting department was practically empty of people. Uh, empty of students, and there were only a couple of faculty. John Clark was one of the faculty members. He passed away a few years after that. And, um, but I don't know, I had trouble articulating what my needs were and as a painter. Uh, so I didn't really know what I wanted when I was a young student. Um, yeah, so I coasted along. But that's a good question. <laughs> now, would you now uh, consider showing your labyrinth paintings that were sort of perhaps approached the subjectivity of your more recent work? Do you mean the uh, 3D ones, the yes. axiometric yeah. perspective? Well, if somebody was interested in showing them, sure. Mm. Nobody's seen them. So, but you, you didn't show them because you were uncertain. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. There's kind of dead space around them, that's all. I see. 
Yeah. I, I wonder if this has been a question I've had for a number of years. Uh, in Vancouver, there's a great interest in monochromes. For hmm. some reason. <laughs> and I wondered if you could eliminate me. Why Conceptual that? art, I guess. People are afraid to paint over there. And are you uh, thinking about anybody in particular, or uh, any works? Well, it, you know, a number of people make reference to their interest in, in monochromes. Uh huh. Big uh, looking dog. Uh, huh. David McLean used to talk a lot about the mono the monochrome. Yeah. <laughs> He has these words for my paintings, like he, the new paintings, he calls them, uh, what does he call them? Um, uh, hostage, you know when you send a note, that a hostage text? To, a ransom note, he calls it ransom note printing. Anyway, um, yeah, I learned about the monochrome, I think, from David. Um, the monochrome is like the ultimate conceptual painting. So that's where the two things reconcile, I guess. But the monochrome in Vancouver, it's funny because there's a show about the monochrome at uh, the Helen Pitt Gallery, and these guys are talking about it in, in, in relation to um, uh, neoliberal culture and money and gray, uh, the grayness of business world, money, et cetera. So I didn't get to see that show yet, but I was kind of interested in that. But yeah, I, I don't know. Um, right now we have so many painters that uh, somehow, I don't know how they emerged, but um, there's no monochromes that I can remember. There's a very interesting set of paintings by Neil Wedman. I don't know if anybody knows Neil Wedman's work, but he made these, uh, he paints in black and white a lot, mostly. Um, monochrome, you could call them. And, um, but he's always figurative and also always kind of thinking about the graphic art, like graphic novels and stuff. He did a series of paintings that are about um, UFOs. And they're, they're gray paintings, vertical gray paintings, and they make you think of Gerhard Richter. But you can, if you look hard, you can see a little UFO floating, it, they're all basically become atmospheric. So then you realize that the gray is an atmosphere, and somewhere in that atmosphere there's a hovering UFO. So they're very interesting comments on uh, monochromes, and I thought they were pretty funny, but... Maybe also Ian Wallace's work? Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of the father. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, yeah. The, you know, at degree zero. Yes. No, he's, he's afraid to, yeah, I think that's the only way he introduces, yeah, the monochrome as he, or painting in his work, is the monochrome. <clears throat> yeah, maybe that's because he has such a fatherly presence in our city. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all.